JAK inhibitors are pretty good therapies that work for, for all of these different pathway activators. Uh, and then there are some relopathies, uh, rel being uh, one of the names of an NF-kappa B, key NF-kappa B gene, um, which then produce cytokines like IL-6 and TNF. And so anti-IL-6 and anti-TNF are the drugs that tend to work quite well for the different mutations, many of which you can see uh, in these different and complicated pathways. And finally, just a few weeks ago, or it may be a month or two ago now, uh, we published some new work on a disease that we think is caused by increased levels of GCSF. And so this could be a granulopathy if you just want to invent a word, as I do. Um, but of course, that may not really be um, as the first of a, of a potential family of diseases related to GCF. It's quite hypothetical at the moment whether that is the case. And indeed, anti-GCSF is not yet clinically approved. And so we don't have the final proof there that um, blocking that is going to work in patients, although it certainly worked very well in mice. So at any rate, I'll try and get through to that story at the very end of the talk today uh, and tell you about it um, to see if it's something you might be interested in. But let's start, I'll try, what I'll do throughout the talk is I'll give you a couple of examples of inflammasomopathies, a couple of examples of interferonopathies. I'm going to skip over relopathies because they're, as you can see, tremendously complicated and actually other people know far more about them than I do. Uh, and then we'll finish with that story about a potential granulopathy. Okay, so drilling down into inflammasomopathies. Um, this is a simple schematic sort of showing you where there's an innate immune sensor, something like pyrin, uh, which is the, the, the innate immune molecule that sort of kicks off an inflammatory reaction. Uh, it's got a pyrin domain, confusingly enough, because the protein's whole name is pyrin, and then it's got a pyrin domain at the end terminus. And that pyrin domain can interact with another pyrin domain in a molecule called ASC, and that molecule called ASC is what forms this large disc-like structure called the inflammasome. And so that is a big filamentous structure uh, which can then recruit caspase 1, and that's an enzyme which cleaves uh, two cytokines, pro-IL-1 beta and pro-IL-18. And caspase 1 also moonlights as a... a and it has an ability to cleave gastermin D. This can then form a pore in the membrane so that the active cytokines, interleukin-1, beta, and then IL-18, can leave the cell uh, and then have their extracellular activities. So uh, what does... The, uh, and just to mention to you that for some of the disorders that I'm going to show you, some of them tend to respond better to IL-1 blockers and some of them tend to respond better to IL-18 blockers. And so you can start to put the different sensors on different sides of this pathway depending on whether patients respond to one or the other. So what does this look like? So um, it's actually quite profoundly... Uh, uh, unique. Uh, and so what occurs, uh, maybe if I can start the movie, no. Um, if we go off laser pointer, maybe that will do the trick. Let's see. <laughs> so what happens is that there is a dramatic reorganization of ASC within the cell. And so it goes from broadly diffuse within the cytoplasm and it all becomes recruited. And what you can immediately see is you only get one spec per cell. Uh, and it's a really good sort of readout for inflammasome activation as this ASC protein oligomerizes. And it's a very robust signaling platform that's very hard for pathogens to sort of disable or, or impede. And here are what patients with mutations in pyrin uh, experience. So uh, these are a um, spectrum of actually quite frequent in certain areas, like in the Mediterranean area, where this disease called familial Mediterranean fever um, was first observed. Uh, they're recessively inherited. And so you need two of these types of mutations down in the C-terminus of the protein to, to result in this disease. And so patients may experience some uh, skin rash, like a, particularly of the lower leg, and you can see the neutrophil histologically here. And also these increased inflammatory neutrophils can be present in the joints, um, so arthritis, and they can be present in other areas as well and leading to gastrointestinal uh, pain and inflammation. Uh, and so patients will experience periodic fevers. So in, in general, this group of inflammasomopathies often have periodic fevers as one of the cardinal features. And they're, they're for different durations and different periods in, in different diseases. But for patients with familial Mediterranean fever, they tend to be sort of monthly fevers lasting between one to three days. And they're very high spiking fevers above sort of 38 degrees. <clears throat> 
Now, what happens is when you get a fever, you have acute phase reactants that are non-specific inflammatory uh, stimuli that, that sort of uh, are turned up by inflammation. Uh, and one of those is called serum amyloid A. It's, it's not specific to this particular pathway. Most inflammatory uh, reactions will result in that. Now, serum amyloid A is problematic, though, because if you have repeated bouts of inflammation, these fevers throughout your entire life, after decades of these increased levels of serum amyloid A, it can actually precipitate out as amyloid deposits within the kidney, and that's potentially um, life-threatening. And so it used to be before um, therapy was identified for familiar Mediterranean fever that this was sort of a um, likely to lead to mortality around age 50 or so. Now, one of the really amazing things about familiar Mediterranean fever is that these variants, um, because they're recessively inherited, it gives the opportunity that if you just had one of, copy of those variants, um, prevalence of those variants, they're actually quite elevated in certain regions, like the Mediterranean, where um, the, the, the disease was first identified, hence the name. But what you can see is that as different diasporas of different populations have moved throughout the, the world and via these trading routes, that the, the prevalence of these variants has maintained or increased over time or at different times. And this raises the possibility that, hey, okay, why is that the case? You know, if you have a disease being caused by these mutations, though they should be not surviving in the general population. They should just decrease year on year. So is it possible that the heterozygotes, people with just one copy of the variants, have actually some benefit? And it turns out that's the case. And so this was worked out a few years ago that during the periods of the first and the second plagues, uh, you know, Black Death, Yersinia pestis. That is the, the periods during which these variants have expanded. You can see it really specifically here uh, and, and more, pr more uh, pronounced it during the sort of uh, early 1300s uh, during the second plague. And then it's started to decrease since, you know, we haven't had these burdens of disease in the general population. And of course, the plague was ripping through these areas, having this massive burden of disease in these populations along these trading routes, exactly where the mutations have increased in frequency, um, adding to the specificity, um, uh, arguing that, that these patients were really uh, experiencing an, an ability to counter the infection, survive better during a really um, devastating uh, bubonic plague. So we learned a little bit more about familial Mediterranean fever and, and resistance to infection by studying pyrin in, in further families. So we found together with Adrian Liston, a really large family um, from Belgium and France who had inherited a disease that was quite different to me from Mediterranean fever. Uh, and like I just said, it was dominantly inherited. And so everyone who had this mutation in pyrin got the disease. And so it wasn't like familiar Mediterranean fever in that regard. But also clinically, I think you can see that here, the inflammatory skin lesions, neutrophilic dermatosis, are far more severe than what uh, I showed you initially for, me, for familiar Mediterranean fever. Although these patients also had periodic fevers and other uh, um, uh, organs with systemic inflammation as well. And because we identified the mutation in pyrin, it was possible to say, well, this is likely to be an inflammasomopathy, and patients got anakinra, which is a molecule that blocks IL-1. And you can see that this, uh, as I mentioned, non-specific inflammatory markers like CRP, which is another one, which is a good readout of inflammation, that really crashes back down to a healthy level after the anakinra therapy was initiated. And indeed, the clinical manifestations that I've just shown to you as well, they also uh, resolved when patients underwent anakinra therapy. And so this really is part of that axis of inflammasomopathies. And what was further in interesting at a molecular level was the particular mutation. So it's in a very different location to the familiar Mediterranean fever locations. And we had a look at that site and it looked like a motif that is typically where a 1433 molecule binds to a phosphorylated residue and serines do get phosphorylated. And so we speculated, well, maybe this is where a 1433 molecule binds to pyrin and we tested that and these immunoprecipitations showed that indeed there was 1433 bound to pyrin and when you make the patient mutation, it wasn't bound anymore. So that actually clued us into the whole mechanism of how pyrin is able to sense bacteria and pathogens like the plague. So what happens here is that uh, pyrin is phosphorylated on this residue to keep it inhibited. And it's, that's accomplished by being phosphorylated by these enzymes, uh, PKN1 and PKN2. And they're constitutively turned on by one of your cytoskeletal proteins called Rho A. Now, 
Yersinia is an obligate intracellular pathogen which tries to remodel the host's cytoskeleton for its own benefits. So it encodes these effectors, YOP E and YOP T, which inhibit Rho A. So what Pyron does to detect Yersinia is it detects when Rho A goes wrong and stops working because then these kinases no longer phosphorylate Pyron and then it can be active to form this inflammasome. But it's an arms race. Yersinia is pretty smart. They've started to encode YOP M. And YOP-M, what it does is it turns on this kinase, PKN1 and PKN2, to phosphorylate and inhibit pyrin. But how does the molecular arms race end? Well, it ends with the familiar Mediterranean fever mutations. So the variants that are there in this pyrin molecule, even though YOP-M is turning on the phosphorylation here, the patients who had familiar Mediterranean fever variants and were at increased uh, benefit uh, they just turned on the pyrin even though it was still phosphorylated. And so it was still being inhibited by these kinases, but it was turned on by the, by the potentially disease-causing mutation if you had two copies. But the one copy was providing some benefit against uh, Yersinia infection. So that's the whole pyrin story. Um, well, there's many other bits I didn't tell you, so it's actually more complicated than that, and that was probably com complicated enough. But nonetheless, in summary, pyrin is mutated in familiar Mediterranean fever, but also that disease I showed you called PAND, uh, and therapy, because it's an inflammasomopathy, uh, needs to be targeted against IL-1 beta. Um, there are some other small molecules that work, but just for, for the emphasis on time, I'll, I'll skip over that. Um, there is this uh, inactivation of pyrin by phosphorylation via those kinases and the actin cytoskeletal machinery being turned on. And uh, the in in inhibition is mediated by these 14.33 proteins. And finally, pyrin is one of these innate immune sensors that can recognize bacterial infections, and it does so in an indirect way, uh, as, as I've described to you there. Let me show you one more inflammasomopathy before we move on to interferonopathies. And this is uh, another innate immune sensor with which uh, we've been very interested, and it's called NLRP1, uh, and it functions in a very different way, and it causes a quite different sort of disease. Patients who have mutations in NLRP1 uh, again, have some skin symptoms together with arthritis and systemic inflammation. But the skin symptoms are quite different. And so in some patients, it's a little bit lichenoid, uh, the lesions in the skin. But in others, the keratinocytes proliferate into really bona fide uh, pre-malignant lesions. And in some cases, or in most cases, they're self-limiting. So they're self-healing palmoplantar carcinomas. Uh, palmoplantar because they typically only affect the soles of the feet and the palms of the hand, which is again, quite unusual. And so they typically last from something like three to six months, but actually self-resolve. However, if those cells um, metastasize somewhere else, they can form a malignant lesion somewhere else and be life-threatening. So they really are truly um, carcinomas in the true sense of the word. Uh, keratinocyte, uh, there's some uh, hyperproliferation in other uh, surfaces, uh, so particularly the barrier surfaces of the eye here, uh, and so that results in some pretty characteristic lesions there as well uh, in a number of the patients. So there are a few of the mutations uh, that affect NLRP1. Some of them were dominant mutations, so just one mutation was sufficient to cause disease in the pyrin domain at the end terminus of NLRP1, and some were recessive in this part of the protein, also sort of in the end terminus. And they led to a revolution in the way we think about NLRP1. Previously, we were thinking about these pyrin domains as being really important for activating the inflammasome and ASC, but for NLRP1, all of these mutations were inactivating mutations. And it turns out this whole end terminus of the NLRP1 is an auto-inhibitory part of the protein. And NLRP1 was unique in these inflammasome proteins is that at the C terminus, it had a card domain. And ASC also has a card domain. And it turns out that in fact, the part of NLRP1 that activates the inflammasome is this C terminal region with the card domain. And it can cleave itself off. It has the ability to autocatalytically cleave and separate itself off. And that's how this N terminal region separates itself from the C terminal region. And that bit is the bit that actually forms the inflammasome and does all the activation.
Now, how do the pathogens link in? Well, the pathogens, the way NLRP1 can detect when your cells are infected is that this whole autoinhibitory N-terminus can be uh, the, the subject of some sort of cleavage or other degradation event from a pathogen. So, for example, rhinoviruses, even COVID and picornaviruses enco enco uh, encode these proteases or other enzymes which target different parts of the N-terminus and cleave them. And when they get cleaved, the NLRP1, the remainder of that N-terminus is destabilized, ubiquitinated, and degraded. And that leaves the C-terminal region to go off and activate the inflammasome. And that's how NLRP1 can detect these pathogens. It's different between human and mice. Anthrax lethal toxin and Shigella can do a similar sort of thing. And the whole process has become termed as functional degradation. Uh, and it's a really elegant way of uh, setting up a protein like NLRP1 to detect pathogen stress by using this whole autoinhibitory domain as something that can evolve and adapt to recognise different pathogen cleavage uh, and enzymes and also phosphorylation. So there is now this new data on um, how phosphorylation, again, in this linker region here in the pyrin domain, which is where a lot of the enzymes cleave, it can be phosphorylated to destabilise NLRP1. And that phosphorylation happens downstream of ribotoxic stress. There's a lot of pathogens that interfere with your ribosomes. And so downstream of ribotoxic stress, you get activation of P38 MAP kinases, and that phosphorylates this region here. And also you get ribotoxic stress downstream of UVB. And so when you get skin inflammation because you've been out in the sun too long and you look at your skin and it's all red, part of what you're looking at there is functional degradation of the NLRP1 N-terminus, turning on the inflammasome and inflammation derived from uh, this inflammasome, uh, specifically the C-terminus of this inflammasome. Now, how does the whole thing get kept auto-inhibited? Uh, similarly, drawing parallels from pyrin, there's a molecule that binds to NLRP1 and keep it inactivated. And this is a molecule called DPP9, dipeptidyl peptidase 9. And it has this wonderful structure that you can see here, resolved by cryo and electron microscopy. And you can see this part of NLRP1 specifically being bound by DPP9. It's quite unique in that, um, so here's a dimer of DPP9, and it's actually more than one set of NLRP1 as well. So here's one half of one NLRP1 with the UPAB motif, just this part of the cleaved region. And so that actually leaves this neoepitope, the new N-terminus of this region exposed. And then it's also got this region here from the, these two bits combined bound here as well. And so what that means is that this thing is a dipeptidyl peptidase. And so what it loves to do is it cleaves peptides and it loves to cleave peptides where the second amino acid is a proline. So the first amino acid can be anything and the second amino acid it loves to target is a proline. And wouldn't you know it, the second amino acid at this new end terminus here, this neoepitope, is proline. And in the structure, you can see that this little tail here of the cleaved part tucks into the binding site of the dipeptidyl peptidase, DPP9, but for various... Um, structural reasons, the DPP9 can't cleave it. It just sits in there and binds it and keeps NLRP1 inactive. Now, wouldn't you know it, aside from all of the destabilizing mutations that I told you about in the end terminus, there was one patient published um, from a French uh, group, Sylvie Gormange, and the mutation was of that proline, proline 12142 an arginine. Uh, and we and others have shown that when you mutate that proline to an arginine, it no longer binds to DPP9, uh, and then the patient develops uh, this, this arthritis, uh, skin lesions, and a, a real inflammasomopathy, and that patient actually benefited from blocking IL-1, blocking the inflammasome cytokines. So that was a really great clinical evidence that everything I showed you there was operating in the way we expected. Now, what about DPP9? Based on everything I've just told you, there should be a disease that you get when you remove DPP9 from the system and activate NLRP1. And indeed, uh, that is what we've just published uh, in the last year or so. Uh, a couple of different families who have uh, a little bit different spectrum of disease, uh, and probably there's some things that DPP9 does that are not related to NLRP1, but they definitely have some... Um, unusual skin lesions, these papillomas that you can see here, some skin pigmentation abnormalities, uh, but also some poor growth and some failure to thrive, some immune, an immune uh, side of pancytopedia as well. Now, to sort of get a handle on 
what parts of that disease are due to NLRP1 and what parts are just things that other things that DPP9 does because these patients lack all of their DPP9 function or almost all of their DPP9 function as far as we can tell. Um, Cass actually did a few experiments in mice. And so what she's done is she's got mice where DPP9 is pretty much totally inactivated. And then she said, uh, those mice are, 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 don't survive. They're just not born. But when we knock out NLRP1, what happens? Do we, do we get any mice? Are they viable? Remarkably, they are. So you can get a few that live. And they live actually pretty long, healthy lives. Now, admittedly, they are not perfectly normal. Their growth is stunted. And perhaps that suggests that DPP9 is, is doing something to the growth of both mice and people, which is not related to the inflammasome. And so unfortunately, uh, the patients who might get anti-IL-1 drugs probably wouldn't have those parts of their disease corrected. But for the other parts, you know, that are immune related, we'd hope that they probably would be corrected. All right, so here's a summary of our inflammasomopathy section. That's all about NLRP1. Uh, the pyrin domain, and indeed that whole N-terminus is autoinhibitory. It's the C-terminal region, which is activatory, and the card domain is the inflammasome-forming component. nlrp one's processed into two fragments, like I said, uh, and it's destabilizing mutations and functional degradation of that N-terminus that pathogens are really uh, adopting, to, and that's how nlrp one can sense infection. The whole thing's kept inactive by DPP9. And if you don't have DPP9, that develops the sort of disease uh, that I've just shown you there. Now, um, for the interest of time, I don't intend to go over all of these inflammasomopathies, but just to show you that there, there are quite a lot. Um, and some of the more canonical ones, like mutations in NLRP3 uh, and NLRP12, um, do benefit quite a lot from blocking interleukin-1. So that's been really beneficial to see. The IL-18, anti-IL-18 molecules are not clinically approved, but they have been in um, some sort of preclinical trials. And in patients, the couple of patients they've been into so far with mutations in NLRC4, they work really well. Um, and there's also some pyrin-related mutations in PSTP rp one and WDR1 that for some reason skew towards the IL-18 side of things, which we don't quite understand. Um, but uh, there's, there's some definitely some interesting research to undergo there. Just to finish, though, on these inflammasomopathies, using the two inflammasomes that I gave you as examples, NLRP1 and pyrin, they're both kept inactive by these inhibitory proteins. And that lends itself to this concept about how our innate immune systems work. So you've got a lot of innate immune sensors which are set up just to directly sense pathogens and bugs. And that's great but it's limited, right? If the pathogen's able to change or evolve that bacterial component that's being detected or viral component that's being detected, for example, then the innate immune sensor just won't work. So you've got to have other innate immune recognition molecules. So one thing you can do is you can detect, again, directly, different parts of a dead or a dying uh, damaged cell. Uh, and these things are called DAMPs or danger associated molecular patterns. They're host molecules, um, things like DNA and RNA from the cytoplasm uh, or a disruption in the trans-Golgi network can activate NLRP3, for example. Um, but again, they're direct recognition of a dead or a damaged cell. And so it's an indirect way of, sorry, and so it's a direct way of working out that a pathogen has affected your cell. But what a lot of these inflammasomes do, and pyrin and NLRP1 are the first examples in humans of, is this indirect mechanism of interaction with the immune system. So you actually monitor a homeostatic process. There's no direct recognition of anything going wrong. It's an indirect recognition. And this guard protein, like the 1433 or the DPP9, is what is pulled off to activate the immune response in an indirect fashion. And so, you know, that's a really nice way of detecting a pathogen infection because you're just monitoring a homeostatic process. You're not directly detecting anything. And so the, the bug has a hard time mutating away from that and avoiding uh, the host's response to the infection. And this is actually how your plant innate immune system works. And so that was the first evidence in humans of something that is the way that plants are set up to detect immune defects. Or, or rather pathogen infection. Okay, swapping gear now to interferonopathies or diseases associated with the type one, uh, type one interferons in particular. These tend to be innate immune sensors which are really good at detecting DNA and RNA in the cytoplasm of your cells. 
usually set up to detect viruses. But in the cases I'll tell you here, they're either activated by mutations in certain families or your host RNA and your host DNA. So let's see how a few of these work. So uh, again, really complicated. Don't worry about the details. We're going to drill into a couple of diseases specifically to explain to you how these pathways work. Let's start with the DNA sensing pathways. Now, obviously, there's a lot of places in your cell, a lot of times where your own DNA might get out of the, the nucleus or mitochondria. But what happens in almost all the cases is that they trigger um, this DNA sensor called C-gas. That's a, a, a molecule that's set up to detect DNA in the cytoplasm, and that then triggers something called sting. So here's how that pathway works and what mutations in that pathway result in. So the C-gas DNA sensor um, binds to DNA in the cytoplasm. It's a rather unique enzyme which combines two things. It combines GAMP and AAM, AMP to make a cyclic dinucleotide called cyclic GAMP. Now, that's a signaling molecule which activates sting. And sting is a, uh, a sensor of bacterial dinucleotides, which also senses this cyclic GAMP that you're, you yourself make in response to infection. Uh, and when sting gets activated, it turns on IRF3, and kappa b uh, and makes type 1 interferons quite profoundly. And this is the type of disease that it causes, a, a familiar purpose-like disease. Uh, this is called sting-associated vasculopathy with onset in infancy. You can see it does typically affect the extremities with some severe vascular lesions, particularly um, tips of the fingers, uh, soles of the feet, and the cheeks and nose, for example, often exposed to the cold. Uh, and that's where these vascular lesions typically arise, but also vascular, uh, you know, being a vasculopathy, it tends to affect the lungs, and so patients have some severe interstitial lung disease. And the systemic inflammation, again, is being read out here via this C-reactive protein. is quite elevated in most patients who have these mutations that activate sting. Um, but fortunately, we know that type 1 interferons signal through um, JAKs, and there are some excellent JAK inhibitors out there. So one of them is called ruxolitinib, and so this patient's got ruxolitinib, and you can see the CRP immediately coming back down towards a normal healthy uh, level. And this patient was one of the first to ever get this drug, and so they sort of thought, well... Was it just a coincidence the patient was having a flare of the disease and it didn't actually get better because of the drug, just, just from a coincidence? Let's take the drug away. And so they did, and you can see that's the dashed part here, withdrawal. But then immediately the disease spikes and the patient relapsed. And so they then went back onto the ruxolitinib straight away and, again, disease was controlled. And so patients are not cured by this uh, ruxolitinib JAK inhibitor treatment, but they benefit very greatly from it and they go on to this uh, therapy um, as a lifelong uh, treatment. So I was slightly oversimplifying the sting pathway. This shows it to you in another way, way with the cell's um, organelle structure intact. So what actually happens is that when C-gas gets activated, it makes this cyclic GAMP, cyclic dinucleotide. That's what sting binds, and sting is usually resident on the endoplasmic reticulum. And when it gets activated, it uses these coatomer complexes to get transported to the Golgi, and that's where it signals from and where the uh, inflammatory signaling molecules are then activated to make the type 1 interferons. But what we and indeed others noticed is that there's this coatomer complex that regulates shuttling back from the Golgi to the ER to recycle things. And one part of this coatomer complex is called COPA. And there were patients who had an autoinflammatory disease with mutations in COPA. And they had indeed inflammatory lung disease. They had some other things going on, you know, some arthritis, some kidney disease. But broadly speaking, it was a similar enough disease to the sting-associated vasculopathy that we thought, well, is COP-A related? Is sting involved? And in, indeed, that's exactly what Annie and indeed three other publications around the same time all found, is that when you don't have COP-A, sting gets accumulated on the Golgi and activated. So here's normal sting activation. When you put in DNA, sting ends up on the Golgi and gets activated, and you can see that co-localization there. And here's what happens when you delete COP-A. Uh, sting can't be recycled back off the Golgi, and so it accumulates there. Now, the Golgi does get quite fragmented because if you don't have COP A, there's other problems. COP A is important for recycling things off the Golgi, and so it's, it's, it's damaged, might damage Golgi probably in this case. But nonetheless, you can quite clearly see sting accumulation and activation there. 
And so just to further push home the point, we've used a sting inhibitor called H151 and can prevent inflammation measured by phosphostat-1 in these copa-deficient cells. And indeed, if you look at cells from patients with copa syndrome and you put on this sting inhibitor, you can reduce the phospho-TBK1, that downstream signaling molecule uh, downstream of uh, sting. So good evidence. Uh, and indeed, patients with copa syndrome have now gone on to receive those JAK inhibitors and they work quite well. But you'd also surmise that perhaps sting inhibitors would work uh, as well. Um, one final thing of interest that I'd like to mention about sea gas and sting is that I was always curious, as perhaps you are, you know, when a cell divides, you've got to divide your nucleus. How is that going to work? Aren't you just going to naturally expose the DNA from your nucleus to this sea gas? And every time a cell divides, why don't you activate this immune response by recognising your nuclear DNA? Well, here's the really elegant way that that doesn't happen. Your DNA is wound up in uh, chromatin with histones on it. And actually, sea gas loves to bind these histones. And when it does that, it can't be activated. It's kept in an inactive conformation. It's only DNA uh, where the chromatin doesn't have histones, where the DNA can bind multiple sites on sea gas, that it then oligomerizes to become activated and make that sea gamp molecule. Now... What's the proof that this is all physiologically important? Well, if you have mutations in this machinery that makes the histones, what happens? You develop an interferonopathy. Patients have high levels of the type 1 interferons. And so, again, uh, that particular disease is called Acardi Gutierrez syndrome, and I'll show you some more image of, of that in a couple of slides. It's... Um, it's a characteristic interferonopathy for which patients have benefited from blocking the jacks again. And so this is a really nice description of how the whole system, again, is kept inactive, which is very important to main, maintain our health and homeostasis. So that was a, a summary of your uh, DNA sensing apparatus, see gas and how it signals to sting by these cyclic dinucleotides. Uh, and Annie's work where COPA is required to, to relieve that inflammation uh, and, and prevent sting from accumulating on Golgi. JAK inhibitors are what works by blocking the type 1 interferons uh, in these interferonopathies like um, I've shown to you there. Uh, and you've got to have things... I didn't mention this to you too much, but apart from the histones which keep... Uh, gas inhibited. There's also a whole bunch of uh, DNAs and other things that degrade any stray DNA that ends up in your uh, cytoplasm. And so I guess th th there are mutations in a lot of those things as well that lead to the accumulation of DNA in the cytoplasm. All right, let's quickly do RNA sensing. So for these RNA sensing pathways, the innate immune receptors that I'd like to pay attention to are Rig I and MDA5. Again, asterisks here. There are patients with families, uh, patients or families with mutations in these genes, which just turn these pathways on. You don't need any ligands. You don't need any RNA around. The mutation just activates the pathway and off it goes. But normally what they're set up to detect is, you know, viral 5-prime uh, triphosphate RNA in the case of RIGI or a viral double-stranded RNA in the case of MDA5. But there are endogenous sources of RNA. And one of them I'd like to mention to you here uh, is actually kept in check by ADAR1, and that's really fascinating. So what is ADAR1 uh, and what happens when it's mutated? Well, you develop uh, Acardi Gutierrez syndrome and also uh, dyschromatosis symmetrica hereditaria. So the thing about Acardi Gutierrez syndrome, which kind of separates it from the other type 1 interferon opathies I've shown you, is that patients develop uh, some calcification of the uh, basal ganglia. Uh, and you can see that here on these uh, MRIs. And that leads to neurodevelopmental delay uh, and... Fortunately, that actually tends to resolve with JAK inhibitor therapy, which is great. Um, patients also have some of the vascular skin lesions, but um, in the patient subset with dyschromatosis symmetrica hereditaria, uh, it's a more of a um, papular uh, defect in, in the pigmentation uh, of, of... And you get these sort of macules affecting the sort of limbs. So uh, a similar sort of disease uh, to what I've shown you earlier for these interferonopathies. Now, what is ADAR1 doing? It is an uh, adenosine to inosine editor. And so what it loves to do is change one base to another in your RNA. Uh, 
Now, how is that relevant? Well, it turns out that 10%, a full 10%, which to me is just a huge number, of your entire DNA in your body is encoded by these ALU repeats, this ret retrotransposon element that just lets love to copy itself throughout your genome. So, you know, 10% of your RNA is this stru characteristic structure of double-stranded RNA, which loves to form these hairpin loops. And the trouble is, what do they look like? They look like viral RNA. And so uh, MDA5 is the innate immune sensor that we encode that would just love to detect these ALU repeats. So how do we avoid that? Well, that's why we've got ADAR1. If you come in and you edit the RNA, you make these bulges and you can't form the hairpin loop structure. It doesn't look like viral RNA anymore and you don't get activation of MDA5. But if you have those mutations in ADAR1, then all of your 10% of your RNA, which looks like this, is able to activate uh, this innate immune response and you get the type 1 interferon response, elevated interferon signature um, and, and disease that I mentioned to you earlier. Now, there are other sources uh, of RNA, and, and one of them is from your mitochondria. Uh, and I don't have enough time to go into the details, but I did just want to show you very quickly the new disease that we haven't, um, that we've only just submitted for the publication like last week, and we haven't talked about it publicly. This is the first time we've sort of revealed it, so to speak. So it is caused by mutations in an RNA exonuclease. So what you've got in your mitochondria is a degradosome with these components, H sub 3 and PNPase, and that's required to keep mitochondrial RNA in check. And they degrade double-stranded RNA in the mitochondria. But then the fragments that they make need further degradation via Rexo2. And we found a single patient with this mutation here, uh, and they had uh, these quite characteristic focal uh, hyperkeratosis and other skin lesions uh, and also a really strong type 1 interferon signature uh, in their peripheral blood mononuclear cells and, and serum. So we were able to work out what happens is basically when this enzyme is inactive, you build up all of this double-stranded RNA because this complex can't work efficiently anymore in the mitochondria. Somehow, we don't know exactly how yet, the mitochondrial RNA escapes from the mitochondria after it builds up, and then when it gets into the cytoplasm, it activates this innate immune sensor called MDA5. And MDA5 and RIGI function in the same way. They trigger MAVs to make this type 1 interferon signature, and that's why the patient should benefit from uh, an anti-JAK molecule, uh, like those JAK inhibitors that I've shown you work for the other type 1 interferonopathies. All right, so that's RNA and DNA sensing. Um, these RNA sensors like Regan I and MDA5 um, can have these auto-inflammatory mutations, which tend to result in diseases like Akata Gutierrez syndrome, uh, but also some have characteristic skin lesions, um, either chilblain type lupuses or the, 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 the more sort of uh, uh, dermal changes that I, I just mentioned to you in the previous slide. And uh, um, you can get there by losing these things that regulate the production of RNA, particularly ADAR1 is a very important one for making sure your nuclear uh, RNA is kept in check. Oh, and we do have one last interferonopathy that I'd like you to mention. Uh, and that's because it's quite unique in terms of not being a protein or an RNA related, sorry, not being a DNA or an RNA related type one interferonopathy. This one is related to mutations in the proteasome. And you might say, well, that's a bit unusual. You know, what's, what's the proteasome got to do with type one interferon? Well, the answer is that there's a lot of families who have mutations in these uh, PSMB genes. So they basically encode every subunit of that proteasome structure, which is required to degrade proteins in your, uh, in your cell. And so aside from uh, fevers and, and uh, skin inflammation, like you can see the nodular skin rash here that some patients get, um, there are some unusual uh, things to note here, like lipodystrophy, uh, and they're quite uh, specific to, to press with these proteasome mutations. And of course, you know, your proteasome does lots of things. And so aside from type 1 interferon, which is very high in patients with press, you should probably expect there'd be some other syndromic features. But in accordance with the fact that they are type 1 interferonopathies, you can see the basal ganglia calcification. And that's very similar to what I showed you earlier with the Akata Gutierrez syndrome. So this is a disease that Sophia in the labs looked into, uh, and she found that, you know, it wasn't related to sting, it wasn't related to the, any of the RNA sensors that she tested, like 
MDA5 and RIG-I, but she tested this RNA sensor called PKR, and it was dependent on that. And you can see the PKR inhibitor here preventing inflammation in the patient cells, um, but the PKR inhibitor, you know, of course, it's not going to do anything for a DNA-dependent disease like SAVI. So what's happening? This disease is due to a buildup of misfolded proteins because the proteasome doesn't work. How does that trigger PKR? It's an RNA sensor. Well, what Sophia found was that actually PKR in this context is being activated by a protein. And quite remarkably, normally uh, a cytokine called IL-24 should be secreted by your cells. But if the proteasome doesn't work, for some reason, this cytokine accumulates in the cytoplasm. And you can see that here in proteasome deficient cells, uh, that the IL-24 cytokine, instead of being secreted, just ends up accumulating in the cytoplasm, activating PKR. And that's what triggers this type 1 interferonopathy. Uh, and that's why patients have indeed now gone on to get these JAK inhibitors uh, and benefited from targeting that, that type 1 interferon appropriately. So a very short summary there for PRAS, obviously. Uh, that's what mutations in the proteasome cause, the type 1 interferonopathy that I showed you there, benefiting from blocking the, jack, the JAKs, for example, um, and a very unusual pathway where uh, PKR can detect the accumulation of misfolded uh, cytokines in the cy cytoplasm, which should otherwise have been degraded. All right, we're coming close to the end. I am going to, as I've said, skip over allopathies. They're really interesting and exciting, but very complicated. And there's other people who could probably explain them much better than I. Uh, if you're interested, we can point you in the right direction. Uh, but I did want to tell you this story. I think it's pretty cool about a disease triggered by GCSF. And this is the disease called APLAID. So patients with APLAID suffer from um, quite blistering skin lesions. And so you can see the neutrophils here in the dermis of these patients, uh, be, you know, fairly different to what I've shown you up to this point. Um, but they also have some arthritis, they have uh, lung inflammatory disease um, and some manifestations in the eye and the gut as well. Uh, Aplaid also features some immune dysregulation. And this tends to be a decrease in class switch B cells, which could be relevant in a number of contexts. And the gene that is mutated is an enzyme called PLC gamma 2. And indeed, it functions, we know, in adaptive immune cells like T cells and B cells downstream of the T and B cell receptor. And so that's quite likely how you get these defects affecting the class switching of the B cell. And that's why patients probably experience some, uh, some, in some repeated infections. But what we didn't have until very recently was an understanding of the inflammation. You know, what was going on with those blistering skin lesions and the inflammatory lung disease? Why do these patients have uh, such an elevation in, in all these inflammatory markers? There was some speculation it could be due to, the, due to the inflammasome, and there's in fact a paper on that. And so we thought, hey, we, we know about inflammasomes and stuff. We can look into that. So. We initially had some scepticism because patients with these mutations in PLC gamma 2 had failed the IL-1 blockers. And that made us think, hey, maybe the inflammasome is not involved. And they'd also failed these JAK inhibitors. So the two big classes of disease I've just shown to you um, with these interferonopathies and inflammasomeopathies, we didn't think this disease was one of those. We couldn't detect the type 1 interferon signature uh, in patients, and we made this mouse model. We took the patient mutation, put it in mice. We couldn't detect type 1 interferons being elevated in these mice as well. So we thought, okay, we'll look just, just to see what's going on, because we do detect a little bit of inflammation. You know, there's a bit of increased um, IL-6 and stuff like that. Let's just knock out IL-6, knock out TNF, knock out caspase 1. Let's see if any of these help any amount. And, you know, there's a tiny bit of benefit in these mice. Um, you know, the body weight decrease because they're a bit runted, the mouse model, you know, it does get a little bit better. But you can check out the survival rates. We really haven't shifted the dial very significantly. Uh, and so mice are all still dying pretty early on uh, after being born. So what is going on? Well, we did a lot of cytokine profiling. And so here's some analysis of some patient uh, serum and what you can see is that the cytokines that are elevated, we do see a bit of elevated IL-1 uh, and a few other things going up a little bit, but there's one that really stands out, and that was GCSF, also hugely elevated in the mice. And it's not like a non-specific thing because as the patients get treated with anti-inflammatories, um, it remains elevated. Uh, and so this is not, we think, a biomarker of inflammation in the patients. We think it's actually the pathogenic cytokine, which is not being kept under control. And how do we... Uh, 
provide some evidence for that? Well, we go back to our mouse model and we treat by blocking anti-GCSF, uh, blocking anti-GCSF, no, sorry, just blocking GCSF with anti-GCSF. And it works really well. So we're actually going into here to establish disease in mice. And what you usually see in these sort of mouse models is that people will, you know, knock things out or block them before they get started. And if you stop them from getting started, that's, that's much easier to do. But here, we're actually blocking established disease where the skin lesions have already formed in the mice. And we can get them back to zero, which is really impressive. While mice receiving control, antibodies, of course, go on to eventually die. But if we keep them on this GCSF molecule uh, to anti-GCSF molecule, we can keep them alive, keep their weight increasing uh, and prevent splenomegaly and things like that. So it's a really efficient therapy uh, in mice at least. Uh, and so now what we're really hoping is that this molecule can become clinically approved because we haven't yet seen um, anything else that works really well for Apalade patients. And that would be a really uh, important addition to our armament of anti-inflammatory therapies in the clinic. All right. Final summary, for potentially the first of what we might one day come to think of as a family of GCSF-dependent diseases. Um, we developed that um, knowledge through a mutation in PLC gamma 2, which we put into mice uh, and showed was not related to IL-6, TNF, et cetera. And it really left GCSF as the only thing that's going on there uh, in mice and in patients, really. Now, the mechanism is really complicated. We don't even begin to understand it. It's, the PLC gamma 2 doesn't even need to be activated in the same cell type that makes GCSF. There's some sort of cell-cell communication that's important in this um, granulopathy. Uh, and there's some uh, really interesting parts of the disease which might be related to PLC gamma 2's enzymatic function. But it's a massive black box at the moment. And you know, if we understand those pathways, the hope would be that like the other pathways I've shown you about, we'll find new proteins and, and it will probably put asterisks next to them uh, as we find that mutations in those parts of the pathway also result in a similar sort of spectrum of disease. And so that would be the hope moving forward. We're able to diagnose and treat more patients uh, if that comes to fruition. So uh, that's all the pathways I've had a chance to tell you about today. Uh, and these are the people, uh, look, there's so many people from Weihai to thank. I haven't been possible to put them all on this slide, but I have put, um, you know, all the people from uh, the lab that are currently in the lab and a couple of ex-members as well. Uh, so thanks to all of you. It's been a real pleasure to work these stories up with many of you over the years. And, and I think there's been some real world outcomes for patients, which is really fantastic. Thanks. I'm not sure if we're still online because this thing seems to be rebooting itself, but. Uh... Thanks, Seth, for a very wonderful talk. Is there any questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, thank you. That was a very clear talk. I love how um, you proved that by addressing these pinpoint mutations in either a guard protein or these regulators, you can cure these auto-inflammatory diseases. But what I'm curious about is how do you find where these mutations are? Do you start, let's say you're given a novel uh, disease, do you start at the symptoms, do you start at the cytokines? How do you pinpoint to find those mutations? Yeah, that, that's a good question. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. Sometimes the mutations sort of identify themselves. Um, what's an example of that? Well, there was a patient who was referred um, recently to our auto-inflammatory disease registry by Paul Gray, and the mutation was in this gene called Ocelin, uh, and that's one of those relopathy genes, and the mutation was in the exact cysteine that Ocelin requires to have its catalytic activity. So in a case like that, you're immediately suspicious that that's causing the disease, despite the fact it's never been seen before. And so you're trying to use things like that to make the patient mutations stand out because you do see a lot of just common variation in the human genome. And so you've got to scour through and sift out the, the noise from the uh, the real variants. And that's, that's not easy to do. And so especially if the gene's never been implicated in an innate immune process, that, that's quite hard. And we're probably missing some of those just because we don't know what the gene does and we, we just don't know how to study it or, how, or that it's involved. But as we know more about the immune system and put these pathways together, then we can start to say, well, hey, that protein is important with this pathway. Does the patient have an elevated cytokine signature? 
But you're right, that's another way you can target it. You can say, well, I don't know what gene's important. Let's go see if we can find, you know, let's go do an RNA sequencing experiment. Let's do some, some fishing and try and find what's different. And then if we can match that to a, a mutation in a pathway, then you can make sense of it. Now, it's hard to do, um, but particular things can stand out, in particularly around the patient's physiology and symptoms, which would, might point you in a particular direction or a cytokine. or, or yeah. So there, there are different ways of tackling it. Hi, I wanted to ask about um, the use of JAK stat, uh, sorry, JAK inhibitors for treating interferonopathies. Um, so JAKs are obviously, there are different types of JAKs and they're implicated in so many different signaling pathways. I wanted to ask if they broadly or specifically inhibit these pathways and are there any unwanted side effects? Yeah, so that's, that. you're absolutely right. And I've, you know, simplified the discussion of the JAK inhibitors for the purposes of this talk, but they do act broadly downstream of not even just the type 1 interferon signalling pathway, but also R6 and a few others. Now, that, on the one hand, probably makes them quite good drugs because they target things quite broadly. Um, but fortunately, perhaps, there's different flavours of JAKs, JAKs 1s, 2 and 3. And so that does give you, to a certain extent, some ability to build in specificity for the inhibitors, but perhaps, you know, for one reason or another, a lot of those JAK inhibitors, whether they're JAK1 specific or JAK2 specific, they tend to have a little bit of activity on the other JAKs and they tend to work pretty well in a number of these different diseases like rheumatoid arthritis and other sorts of things. And so they're approved for a variety of indications and, you know, some work slightly better than others, but it's actually not massive differences. But because they're broadly inactivating a bunch of different pathways, they do come with some possibilities of infection. Uh, and so, yeah, I think there are, there's, there's a black box warning on, on the drugs for clinicians to watch out for that. But um, the good thing is that you can tend to take the drugs away and, and treat the infection if, if it gets to that point. So, they're, you know, they're not, it, it doesn't scare off, you know, for these types of diseases where they have such big effects, it's really a logical choice of therapy. Hi. Hi, Seth. Um, thank you for the great talk. Um, I was quite interested because you talked a lot about therapies where you block um, IL-1 beta, but particularly in NLRC4, why is blocking IL-18 preferential compared to the un other inflammasome yeah. diseases? So the idea would be, and, and the, the truth of the matter is, of course, we don't really know, but here's some speculation. You know, the cell type which has the mutant gene in it. For example, if it's NLRP1, as you'd perhaps expect, NLRP1 is expressed a lot in the skin. And then I've shown you that disease tends to affect the skin a lot. And skin cells, these keratinocytes, they're full of IL-1 beta. And so that's why that tends to be an IL-1 beta dependent disease, we think. But then for NLRC4, um, it tends to be expressed quite highly in uh, cells in the lining, the wall of gastrointestinal tract, and those cells tend to be full of IL-18, and so we think that's why those patients have such high levels of IL-18 and they develop really severe gastrointestinal in infancy uh, inflammatory sort of type bowel disease. So um, th those sort of enterocolitis are pretty severe and IL-18 is really high. It's a really obvious sort of thing. Um, and hopefully anti-IL-18 therapies will become approved. They've definitely been used in a couple of cases and worked really well, so hopefully um, that can be expanded. Um, I was just wondering, so you mentioned that the heterozygous mutation in pyrin sort of is able to keep it active. Uh, does that cause any sort of background damage or is it like constantly active at a low level? Or how yeah, that that's, a, that's a good question. You'd sort of think that would be the case, but probably what it does is it's probably multifactorial. So if you're unlucky enough to have one copy of the variant, which shouldn't make you sick, but you have some other environmental stresses or something like that, it probably would be deleterious a little bit. But it's definitely turned the signal down quite a lot from familial Mediterranean fever. But by which I mean to say is that if you look in clinics and you just go and sequence everyone in, in one of these hospitals in the Mediterranean region, which they've done in a couple of studies, it turns out that a bunch of people who are turning up and sort of, you know, complaining about low-grade inflammation have heterozygous mutations in the gene. And so you could expect that there's an association there. It's just 
hard to sort of work it out because it's not um, usually as bad or as obvious or as periodic as for the for Mediterranean fever. And so it just doesn't turn out in families in the same sort of way. Um, but I think you're right. I think it, it, it does result in some low-level underlying inflammation. Thanks, guys. Is there any other questions in the audience? Hey, great talk. Uh, at the start of your talk, you mentioned one of the conditions where there's an increase in serum A beta production and that getting precipitated out and getting deposited in the kidney. Is it getting deposited any, anywhere else, in any other organs, perhaps centrally, in the central nervous system? That's a good question, and you're pushing my knowledge banks here. I, I think the answer is no, but I'll give the caveat that I might be wrong. And the other caveat that I'd give you is that apart from serum amyloid A, there's a bunch of other amyloids that do get deposited in other organs. But for serum amyloid A, definitely, um, you know, as an amyloid, because there's a lot of different amyloidoses, but as far as I know, for patients with familial Mediterranean fever and serum amyloid A, the, the, the organ um, that's affected is the kidney, you know, and, and that, that I think that's that's broadly true in general, yeah. Um, I can't say if there's any online. Is there? Last chance to get a chocolate. Hi, that was a great talk. Um, I was just wondering, you were talking about the um, proline that gets embedded in the catalytic domain. Is there a way to identify why it doesn't really get cleaved or like would any um, amino acid that's that with similar properties, if you replace it, would you have the same effect? Yeah, I'm, I'm not much of a structural biologist, um, so probably I can't explain that to you very well. But my understanding is that from those structures that I showed you, they can work out why a proline that spot, um, most amino acids, most peptides that get in there should get cleaved. But there is a particular orientation of the way NLRP1 does it that it can't get cleaved. But I don't actually understand, you know, the water bonding and things that are required to set that up, but it's just a particular structural arrangement, um, which is just unusual. Thank you. Okay, if there's no more questions, we might wrap it up since it's after 12 now. Um, thanks again, Seth, Seth, for such a wonderful talk.